Okay, um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome. My name is Iman Bukadum. I'm with the um, American Constitution Society at large chapter, and we are so pleased to have an incredibly distinguished panel um, this afternoon uh, on this Friday, April 17th, um, to discuss the Supreme Court and um, religious freedom and national security. So, just uh, from the top, I'd like to um, just provide some administrative um, administrative information to folks out there who are joining us. Um, we definitely want to hear from you and would love uh, questions. Um, we're going to probably have each speaker speak for about 20 minutes each, and then we'll have um, a question and answer moment. Um, and also, we can... Uh, folks can actually get CLE credit for this. So this event has been approved for one hour of California um, CLE credit. So if you would like to claim your CLE credit, please send an email to lcemails at acslaw.org with your bar number and the state you're seeking credit um, in to receive your certificate of completion and feedback um, and put at large CLE in the subject line and CLE materials are available on the events uh, website um, at the acslaw.org website. Um, and we just wanted to shout out to the DC ACS chapter for co-sponsoring this with our at-large chapter. And we're very, very excited, as I said, to be discussing um, a really interesting and salient topic. So um, I'll start uh, by providing a very brief biography <laughs> of our two very distinguished speakers. We're very, very lucky today to have um, Professor Douglas Laycock. Um, he is perhaps the nation's leading authority on the law of religious freedom and also on the law of remedies. He has taught and written on these topics for more than four decades at the University of Chicago, the University of Texas, University of Michigan, and now at the University of Virginia, my undergrad alma mater, go who's. Um, so Professor Laycock is obviously somebody who is very well known um, at the Supreme Court level. He's been uh, quoted by justices on the Supreme Court. He's filed innumerable amicus briefs, um, and he's obviously co-authored leading case books on modern American remedies and the award-winning monograph, The Death of the Irreparable Injury Rule, and many other articles. He's also co-edited a collection of essays on same-sex marriage, religious freedom, and so on and so forth. So we're extremely honored to have um, Professor Douglas Lakeock. Let's give him a virtual round of applause <laughs> um, remotely. And um, we also are very, very honored to have um, another very distinguished professor who is going to bring a very different vantage point, which is really a very, is, is a treat, um, because we're going to have our, our uh, Professor Rakoff discussing um, the First Amendment and religious freedom and statutes, but we are also going to have an immigration expert who's going to work, who's going to discuss um, her extraordinary um, wealth of knowledge, and that's Professor Shoba Wadhia, who is also a really remarkable scholar who, uh, who I have, be I've benefited so much from her from her um, research in recent years. And she is the Samuel Weiss Faculty Scholar and Clinical Professor of Law at Penn State Law School. And her research focuses on the role of prosecutorial discretion in immigration law and the intersections of race, national security, and immigration, and the way that it, and particularly in the ways that it impacts religious minorities. Um, and her research focuses on the role of prosecutorial discretion, as I mentioned, and she's published more than 30 um, law review articles and so many books. Um, her work has been published in Emory Law Review, Texas Law Review, um, Harvard Latino Law Review, Columbia's journal on, uh, Columbia uh, Journal on Race and Law, and of course, she's also a very distinguished author, and I love her book, Banned. Um, uh, it's B-A-N-N-E-D, Immigration Enforcement in the Time of Trump, which was released in 2019. Um, and she also has another very important book called Beyond Deportation, The Role of Prosecutorial Discretion in Immigration Cases. And um, Professor Wadhia is probably one of the preeminent scholars on the so-called travel ban that 
Professor Trump, um, uh, Professor Trump, <laughs> Donald Trump, not Professor yeah, Trump. Uh, I wish he was a professor, um, that Donald Trump uh, signed um, in his first week in office. So she is one of the preeminent scholars on that issue, and she's going to be discussing that a little bit, and also discussing, of course, um, post 9 11 and the moments um, uh, right after that horrible atrocity, and also uh, right up until the travel ban. So um, I'm very honored to have all of you with us today. And with that, um, I'd like to you know, turn it over to Professor Laycock, um, if you wouldn't mind just providing some background on the, uh, on religious freedom, um, where we were, you know, what the First Amendment looks like and um, what the jurisprudential landscape looks like. And also, um, you know, what, what are the major uh, Supreme Court cases out there that we should all be aware of and uh, that inform our current uh, religious freedom? <coughs> Okay, well, this is about half my course in 20 minutes, but I'll do, the, I'll do the best I can. I'm on my wife's computer. That's the Aurora Borealis swirling around behind me in case you're mystified. Um, so the Supreme Court in 1990 in a, in a case called Employment Division versus Smith um, fundamentally changed the rules of the Free Exercise Clause. And that produced a lot of reaction from Congress, from state legislatures, from state courts. Uh, and the result is that we now have uh, a disparate set of sources of religious freedom law. Um, each source has its own standard that it applies to review whatever is being challenged, and each source has its own scope of application, and you kind of need a, a flowchart to keep track of all of them. And it's in flux. The Supreme Court never explained what it meant in the point of division versus Smith, and now it has agreed to reconsider it. So um, I'll, uh, I'll try to tell you where we are. So start with the free exercise clause in the First Amendment. Uh, that's what the court changed. Um, <clears throat> the free exercise clause applies only to laws that are not neutral towards religion or to laws that are not of general applicability. Um, if the plaintiff can show the claimant can show either one of those, then the standard is compelling interest and narrowly tailored. Um, so the key is what does the threshold mean? What does it mean for a law to be generally applicable or not generally applicable? And the Supreme Court has never explained um, in 30 years since Smith. There are only two cases that touch on it. Uh, one is Masterpiece Cake Shop, which is a famously ambiguous opinion. Uh, and, and the other is Church of the Lakumi Babalu IA versus uh, Hialeah, which is uh, an extreme set of facts that government always uh, insists is distinguishable. Um, so if you are a government lawyer, Generally applicable is an odd way of talking about bad motive, uh, which they, of course, deny that they have. Or it might mean singling out. So Lukumi was the animal sacrifice case. Florida and the city of Hialeah were not interested in, uh, in uh, protecting animals except from false religions. So you could kill an animal in Hialeah for just about any reason you could imagine, but you could not sacrifice one in a, in a ritual or ceremony. Um, so religion really was singled out, and the court said that's not the standard. The, these cases fall far short of wherever the line is, but they didn't specify where the line is. The closest thing they came to a test was uh, where they said these laws are not generally applicable because they allow similar conduct that undermines the city's interest to the same or greater extent. So. Um, and, and that's very common. So if there are secular exceptions or gaps in coverage that undermine the interest that the government is asserting as its reason for burdening religion, the law is not generally applicable. That's my view. Uh, I think it's clearly the better view. It is, uh, there's a circuit split. Um, and uh, most of the decisions that seriously engage the issue say if you have Secular exceptions that undermine the government's interest, you have to have a religious exception as well. And the, the best known case in that line is Fraternal Order of Police versus the City of Newark, uh, written by Judge, Judge Alito when he was on the Third Circuit. Um, it's two Muslim police officers who were growing beards for religious reasons, that we were obligated to grow beards. Um, the city had a clean shaven rule. Uh, it had a medical exception. Um, some percentage of African-American men have difficulty shaving because of a medical condition with a long Latin name. Uh, 
uh, and uh, there was an exception for them, and Alito said, you're valuing medical needs more highly than religious needs, you're devaluing religion, and that's what the First Amendment forbids, even under the Supreme Court's new uh, interpretation. Um, <clears throat> the leading case, uh, the other way, is, uh, is a Ninth Circuit case that, that basically says you can target an individual religious practice as long as you disguise it a little bit. Um, and the Supreme Court has never resolved that split. What they have done in a case called Fulton versus City of Philadelphia the, that is being briefed over the summer and argued in the fall, they have agreed to reconsider Employment Division versus Smith. Four of the conservatives called for that reconsideration in, a, in an opinion uh, joining a certain denial a year or so ago. Um, uh, Fulton is, um, is a foster parent. Uh, the other plaintiffs are uh, the Catholic Charities Adoption Agency in, in Philadelphia. Uh, they've been uh, disqualified from placing children because they don't place children with gay parents. Plenty of other adoption agencies that do. Um, Third Circuit upheld the city's rule um, in part uh, on the ground that it was neutral and generally applicable and so you didn't have to go any further. It didn't have to be justified. Um, and um, the cert petition claims, well, it isn't generally applicable. I think they're very weak on that, actually. And, and second, that this should be reconsidered. And so there's going to be full-scale briefing, I'm sure, by Dustin Slimiki on whether Smith was a good idea or not. But that's the current state of play under the main line of free exercise cases. Law has to be neutral and generally applicable. And if it isn't, then it has to be justified by a compelling government. Second, there's a whole other line of free exercise cases um, about internal church governance, and in particular, the employment of clergy and other people in a position of religious leadership. And the, the usual name for it is ministerial exception, but it's not just about ministers. It obviously has to include priests and rabbis and imams, and, uh, and it includes other position, people in positions of religious leadership. And the, the Supreme Court, there are 40 years of law on this in the Courts of Appeals. The one Supreme Court case is Hosanna Tabor Lutheran Church and School against the EEOC, um, which unanimously adopted the ministerial exception at the Supreme Court level. The plaintiff there was an elementary school teacher uh, who was certified as what Missouri Senate Lutherans call a commissioned minister, which is between lay people and ordained. Um, but she was basically a fourth grade teacher, but she taught the religion class and she led the kids in prayer three times a day and she led the chapel service several times a year. Um, and the court said she was uh, a minister within the ministerial exception and could not sue her church for employment discrimination. Now, this is sometimes hard on the employees, but it means that judges and juries don't second guess religious decisions about who's a good minister and who's not a good minister. Um, there are two cases pending, uh, being argued over the telephone in May, and will be decided in the summer. Um, the lead case, with the, we'll probably put place the name on it, is Our Lady of Guadalupe School versus Morrissey, Peru. And these are both from the Ninth Circuit. The plaintiffs are both elementary school teachers who teach a religion class, who lead the kids in prayer, who look a lot like the plaintiff in Hussain and Tabor, um, but who do not have a title like commission minister. And, um, and the, the court in Hosanna Tabor talked about four reasons why she clearly qualifies and the Ninth Circuit's position is you have to have all four of them. And, and the school's position of, position, of course, is it's, it's the totality of the circumstances and some things are more important than others. And the most important is what religious functions are they performing? Um, so we will presumably get an answer on, on that. Um, in some of the lower courts, the second line of uh, free exercise cases applies to other clearly internal church decisions. I think this is why everyone agrees that the clergy can't be required to perform wedding ceremonies that they disapprove of, uh, but those issues have not gotten to the Supreme Court. When this line applies, the standard appears to be absolute protection. There's no talk about compelling interest or anything like that. This is internal. It's for the church. We don't mess with it, is what the court appeared to say. And, was out of tape. Okay, third, you have the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act. 
which Congress uh, passed in response to Employment Division versus Smith. It tried to restore the previous uh, free exercise test as a matter of statutory right. Um, if there's a substantial burden on religious practice, government has to justify it by compelling interest and least restrictive means. Uh, it applies only to federal law and to the implementation of federal law. So it applies to all the agencies. Um, <clears throat> the court held it unconstitutional to apply to the states. So, um, so this is good only against federal law. Um, the the uh, statutory text and legislative history are clear. It means all federal law. I'm sure when we get to national security cases and immigration cases, the government's going to argue it shouldn't apply there. There ought to be an exception. There is no textual basis, whatever, for that. There is no legislative history basis for that. Uh, I forgot to dig up the name. There's a DC circuit case uh, with a Sikh, uh, a Sikh plaintiff who wanted to serve in the military wearing a turban, uh, and the court held it applied against the military. Um, so RIFRA is pretty powerful where it applies, and the Supreme Court has enforced it uh, seriously. There was, I mean, there was fear that after the Supreme Court minimized free exercise, it would minimize the statute as well, and that hasn't happened. Um, I think that's partly because the statute is more specific, has more detailed language. It was passed in 1993 instead of 1791. Um, it's a it's a modern mandate, um, but also you know, since you know, 1990, uh, when the court did appointment division versus Smith, there's been a lot of ideological drift, and um, you know, the the conservatives on the court now see their religion as having trouble with the law, and so they're much more interested in protecting uh, the free exercise of religion. And statutory interpretation is the way that they've been able to been able to do it. So. Um, uh, uh, Hobby Lobby, which of course is a controversial case, was decided under the uh, under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Uh, that was 5-4 for kind of obvious reasons. Uh, Ocentro versus uh, Gonzalez uh, protected a small group in uh, New Mexico that uses hallucinogenic drugs in their worship service. That was 8-0, it would have been 9-0, except it fell between Alito and O'Connor. Um, you know, the, the court uh, on both ends is pretty sympathetic uh, to enforcing RIFRA when there isn't a, a clear a competing interest group on the other side that, that divides them. Um, there are two cases, two RIFRA cases pending. Um, uh, Tanzan versus Tanfer is uh, uh, a group of Muslim men who were pressured by the FBI to become informants on other Muslims. Uh, they refused, and the allegation is the FBI put them on the no-fly list in retaliation. Um, the issue in the su Supreme Court is, can you get damages against a government official under, uh, under RIFRA because uh, the government backed off. It took, after the complaint was filed, took them off the no fly list and mooted out the, the injunction claim. Um, and of course the government says, you can never get damages against us unless you say so four different ways. Um, and and the national security background is going to make the conservatives less sympathetic, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, but we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Um, you know, they're going to have real governmental immunity problems, even if they win on this issue of whether they can get damages. So, uh, and in most cases, the injunction is the remedy you really need. So this is, this is important in, in a few contexts, but it's not at the heart of RIFRA. The other case that's up there, um, uh, two consolidated cases, the lead name will be Little Sisters of the Poor against uh, Pennsylvania. The companion case is Trump versus Pennsylvania. Uh, multiple issues, it's a smorgasbord, and, and I don't know how they're going to handle the oral argument, but uh, for me, the lead issue is do the, the agency, the federal agencies are regulated by RIFRA. There's no delegation that says they can make rules to implement it. They're supposed to comply with it. Uh, it, it tells them what they can do. They cannot burden a religious practice without a compelling government interest. Um, do they have any discretion to comply with RIFRA voluntarily? Uh, the Third Circuit says they're confined to judicial interpretations of RIFRA and can't go one inch more, which is, I think, wrong and pretty unworkable. Uh, there are also claims that the Trump people violated the Administrative Procedure Act. Again, they seem to do that about every day. 
um, and a claim that this is about the contraception exemption, which the Trump people greatly broadened uh, the way Obama had done it, uh, despite all the rhetoric around uh, Hobby Lobby. Everyone was going to get a free contraception uh, just through a, a different method. Uh, the Trump people took that away. Um, you can be exempted just by asking, uh, and uh, you don't really even have to show substantial burden. Um, on, on your religious practice, uh, and there's, and you don't have to comply with the alternate method uh, under which your secular insurance company provided free contraception. So, uh, so the claim is taking free contraception away from some of these female employees violates the establishment clause. Um, I don't think the court's going to go there, but they might. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, so those are the big, broadly applicable federal bodies of law, federal free exercise with the general applicability requirement or the internal church governance prong and the federal RIFRA. Briefly, a couple of other things. The Religious Land Use uh, and Institutional Persons Act, uh, RELUPA, uh, which Congress passed after uh, RIFRA was struck down as the point of the states. Uh, the standard is compelling government interest in least restrictive means. Uh, it applies only to state and local prisons and mental health institutions and uh, state and local land use laws. Um, Congress tried to reenact RIFRA as, uh, to make it apply to the states under other powers that hadn't been at issue in the case that struck it down, the Commerce Clause and the Spending Clause. They couldn't agree on that. They, they've been unanimous in 1993. They were not unanimous anymore by 1998. Uh, but the two things they could agree on, surprisingly enough, were local zoning laws, where they amassed a huge hearing record of discrimination against churches, and um, prisons, because prison fellowship lit up the phone banks of Congress and demanded the prisoners be included. Um, there are also so, so compelling government interest is the general standard. There are also some specific non-discrimination rules in the land use uh, provisions. Uh, there's been a lot of litigation on behalf of mosques under the land use provisions, also on behalf of evangelical Christian churches and Orthodox Jews. Um, and the lead case in the Supreme Court is Holt v. Hobbs, which is a Muslim prisoner in Arkansas who wanted to grow a beard uh, for religious reasons, obviously. Um, the, the Arkansas people basically took the view that they didn't have to do anything, that every anything they said was a compelling interest. Um, including my favorite argument was here's a statute that requires you to make religious exceptions. And he said, we have a compelling interest in never making an exception for anything because the other prisoners will resent it. Um, that's another 9-0 win in the Supreme Court uh, for a religious liberty claim. Um, 21 states have their own religious freedom restoration acts that apply only to state law, obviously, and so are less salient today, but, um, but they, uh, uh, but they obviously sometimes target um, Muslims and other religious minorities uh, as well. Um, they apply the compelling government interest test. Uh, some of them have exceptions. The federal refer applies universally to federal law, no exceptions. Um, state bills were drafted later, and some of them exempt prisons, some of them exempt drug laws, some of them exempt uh, uh, various other kinds of things. Um, and then this count is a little fuzzier, but about 12 state constitutions uh, in states without a state RIFRA have been interpreted to uh, apply some form of heightened scrutiny to burdens on the free exercise of religion, usually the compelling interest test, but some of them are more like intermediate scrutiny. Um, just 33 altogether, and includes all the big states except California. Um, New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Texas, Florida, Michigan, uh, all have either a state referent or uh, a good interpretation of a state constitution, Ohio. Um, <clears throat> so those are five different sources of law. Um, let me briefly tell you about a couple other cases that are pending in the Supreme Court. It's been a big year. The, I think uh, once Kavanaugh replaced Kennedy, all the conservative religious groups thought, now's our time, let's file our cert petition. Uh, Espinosa versus the Montana Department of Revenue, who has already been argued, and it builds on a case from a couple of years ago called Trinity Lutheran School against Comer. Um, if the government is funding things in the private sector, 
uh, can exclude religious organizations who are doing the same thing. Uh, Trinity Lutheran, they said, no, that would be easy. That was a safety precaution, a, a rubberized playground surface. They dropped a footnote that reserved the issue of schools. Esper knows about schools. So Montana funds secular private schools, but not religious private schools. Is that unconstitutional discrimination? There's a justiciability issue at the threshold, that, but I think they're going to reach the merits, and I think they're probably going to say five before that you have to include the religious schools. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's the only one pending that I haven't, haven't mentioned. I haven't talked about much about the establishment clause, but obviously the conservatives have been rolling it back. Uh, they're going to neutral funding instead of no funding ever. Um, I actually think that's probably better and fairer, but that's controversial. And then on, on prayer and religious symbols, they're just saying states can do whatever they want. So American Legion versus American Humanist Association a year or two ago uh, upheld a 40-foot cross in the middle of the main intersection in town. Um, town of Greece versus, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the plaintiff. Um, upheld um, Christian prayers to open city council meetings. Uh, it's pretty much uh, anything goes in, in that area these days. Uh, they haven't quite said absolutely anything goes, but it's been a long time since they found something uh, they were willing to strike down. Um, then there are also a lot of free speech cases about religious uh, freedom of speech. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of states and localities, and especially school districts, try to exclude religious speakers from limited public forums. Um, and sometimes they get away with it, but for the most part, the court has said uh, religious speech is at the heart of the First Amendment. It's just like political speech, and, you know, and it's a source of viewpoints. It's not just a subject matter, so excluding it is often viewpoint discrimination. So there have been a number of, of decisions there protecting the rights of religious speakers. Uh, that's a pretty fast flyover, but uh, it's a checklist of the sources of law that are available to you uh, if you get involved in one of these cases. Thank you so much, Professor. I'm I'm really impressed. You're able to condense um, a whole semester of law school into you know just a quick, quick uh, twenty minute overview. Thank you so much. Um, that is no easy feat. I appreciate it. Uh, now we're just going to pivot to um, Professor uh, Mwadhia, who's going to discuss. The, the Muslim ban. Um, so on January, January 27th, 2017, we know that um, legions of lawyers descended upon airports to try to help with, um, you know, people who are coming from various countries in the Middle East, the Muslim world, um, because of this executive order. And on June 26, 2018, um, the Supreme Court in a five to four decision basically ruled in favor of um, executive authority, in favor of national security, um, notwithstanding statutory arguments that were pretty compelling and also um, First Amendment religious freedom um, arguments and also national origin arguments. So now we're gonna turn it over to one of the leading scholars on that. Professor Wadhia, take it away, thanks. Uh, thank you uh, and um, thank you for inviting me. I hope that people who have joined are safe and healthy during these very uncertain times. I am not as ambitious, so I'm really gonna cover um, a few things um, in the immigration space. And as Iman already said, I come to this issue as an immigration lawyer um, and someone who has been sitting with the immigration statute for more than 20 years. And I thought I might, uh, as a backdrop, share a bit about each branch of government before I talk specifically about a 9-11 policy and then, of course, the travel ban. So Congress wrote the Immigration and Nationality Act, which is the statute for immigration, in 1952. And it remains the primary framework for immigration today. It outlines the reasons a person might be able to seek admission temporarily or permanently. It also identifies reasons that a person might be excluded, including but not limited to national security reasons. In 1965, Congress um, passed landmark legislation that uh, got rid of national origin quotas that were in the statute for several decades. 
And this is of import when we talk about the travel ban, because it was the indication and recognition by Congress that when it comes to the admission of immigrants to our country, that should be a discrimination free system. And to recognize it further, Congress wrote this non-discrimination clause at section 202 that says that place of birth, national origin, and other factors should not be taken into account in deciding um, who gets a visa and who doesn't. So now let's move to the executive branch. Um, the executive branch plays a really important role too. Congress delegated many of the immigration functions to federal agencies. So Professor Laycock talked about uh, the way religious freedom or liberty law works federally as well as at a state level. Well, in immigration, it's largely a federal policy. And so Congress's choice to delegate most of those functions to federal agencies means that all eyes are on how the executive branch is implementing laws it has been delegated and how it is uh, interpreting or making new ones. And, and through and through, both in the era of 9-11 and in the Trump era, we've seen the executive branch playing a really significant role in issuing uh, policies through tools like regulations, executive orders, uh, policy memorandum, and they seem ministerial because they're not statutes, right, or the U.S. Constitution, um, but they in fact play such a, a pivotal role in um, how people's lives are impacted and how immigration law works on the ground. And then finally, if we just look at the courts and immigration, um, a few things are worth noting. Uh, you know, national security is almost the signature exception, um, where courts really have been resistant since the 19th century, frankly, from stepping in in the political branch decision making. And so the political branches are identified as the legislative and the executive branch. So when there's that resistance to play a robust role as a judiciary, um, you already have limits on what courts can do. So we can talk about what we think the role of courts are, um, either in the Q&A um, or uh, if, if it comes up naturally in my discussion. So I, I was practicing immigration law in, starting in about 1999, 2000, and I was at an attorney's meeting uh, when 9-11 happened. And that was a real significant shift in how immigration law and policy was playing out on the ground. And we also saw that many of the policy changes were not coming from Congress. They were coming from the executive branch. In fact, policy after policy came out of memos, regulations, announcements by the former attorney general, um, changing immigration law as we know it. And one recurring theme was that national security was used as the proxy for many immigration policies that targeted primarily Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities. Um, and the travel ban, if you will, at that time was a program called Special Registration or the National Security Entry Exit Registration System. And it was announced by the former Attorney General John Ashcroft in 2002. And he said, quote, this system will expand scrutiny for those visitors who may pose a national security concern and enter our country end quote. And what happened afterwards was pretty revealing. The program was expanded to certain men who were already here in the United States, and it targeted people based on nationality and religion. Uh, men from 25 countries were targeted, and 24 of those countries were Muslim-majority countries. And the fallout of NSEERS really went on for over a decade. Um, for some men who went to local immigration offices to comply, um, the special registration included being questioned, being fingerprinted, being photographed, 
some of those questions included how often do you pray? Where do you pray? How often do you travel to the Middle East? Where did you rent your last video for those young enough to remember blockbuster video? Um, so these were some of the questions that were asked all in the name of national security. And what happened is that many of these many times young men um, had a visa violation. Maybe they had overstayed their visa. Um, and so in exchange for coming forward, they were served with the charging document, which in immigration law is called the notice to appear. So more than 13,000 of these men who came forward were issued these charging documents um, after complying with the special, special registration program. It took over 15 years of advocacy and ultimately the regulation that gave rise to special registration was repealed in an 11th hour rulemaking venture by the Obama administration through a final rule. So the special registration program was, it was discredited long before it ended by regulation. It was, in my view, discriminatory, and it was certainly costly. Even the former INS commissioner, James Ziegler, talked about the huge investment the government was making to actually operate this program and what was given in the end, right? No one found the needle in the haystack. So around this same time where President, now President Trump is on the campaign trail, there's a lot of rumors about a Muslim registry. Not only do we have an announcement by the president for a total and complete shutdown of Muslim immigration to the United States, but people started talking about NSEERS again. And so many of the calls I was getting was sort of, give me the 15 year history of special registration. And there's an infamous picture of Chris Kobach who's holding a stack of books. He was rumored to maybe be a cabinet member for the president. He was also the architect of the NSEERS program. And so that was also what led to the reliable rumors um, that the so-called Muslim registry in the current administration might be something like um, NSEERS. So now let's move to the Trump administration. Um, he made good on his promise, some might say, myself included. Um, and Aman mentioned the, the first a uh, so-called travel or Muslim ban that was announced as an executive order on January 27th, 2017. So pay attention to that timing. This is seven days after inauguration. It was signed at about 4.30 p.m. on a Friday. So for students and professors in the room, we're at about week two of the semester. Um, so my clinic was quite busy as were clinics across the country in trying to make sense of what this executive order means. Penn State University where I sit is the fourth most affected university in the country by the first Muslim ban. So it was quite remarkable to have almost 300 people in rural Pennsylvania show up at our community forum um, when we had our first sort of teaching about um, the Muslim ban and who it affects. Now, there's some controversy about what to call this ban. Is it a Muslim ban? Is it a travel ban? Is it a travel restriction? Um, and, you know, I personally value uh, using different terms depending on who your audience is. Um, in central Pennsylvania, I'm going to reach more people by using a more neutral title, and I'm going to be able to deliver the same information accurately. As a scholar, I think it's quite accurate to call this ban a Muslim ban. And the reason why calling this travel ban is potentially problematic is that we're not just talking about people who can't come for a weekend to go to Disney World. We're talking about families who are indefinitely separated and parents who are unable to enjoy or see the milestones of their children and their grandchildren. So this kind of permanent exclusion um, um, targeting countries that began as Muslim majority countries, in my view, make the Muslim ban label the accurate one. 
So there were in fact three different versions of the uh, Muslim ban. And the first two were struck down by courts um, on statutory grounds, constitutional grounds, or both. But the third version stuck. And the third version was announced as a presidential proclamation. It sounds very ceremonial. Um, it, it is a little ceremonial, uh, but it's a close cousin to the executive order. Um, it comes from the president, um, it, it, it is legally binding, but these tools, executive orders and presidential proclamations, they cannot violate the statute and they cannot exceed constitutional limits. And that is precisely why they were challenged in court on those grounds, among others. So this third version, the presidential proclamation, um, unusually went into effect before the Supreme Court even made a decision about its legality. And the way that happened is that the Trump administration leapfrogged to the US Supreme Court and asked it to stay injunctions that had been put into place um, before it even made a decision. So in fact, the third version of the ban has been in full effect since December 4th, 2017. So the US Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the ban um, April 2018, rendered its decision on June 26, 2018. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts wrote the uh, majority opinion for the court. It was a 5-4 decision. And he found that the proclamation was legal. And he uh, found it to be so for a few reasons. First, there is a section in the immigration statute called 212F. And it is a suspension clause. It says that the president may suspend the entry of any alien or class of aliens if such entry would be detrimental to the interests of the United States. And this language has been the hook for the administration, not only for the Muslim ban, but for many immigration policies that have been announced during the first three years of the Trump administration. And Chief Justice Roberts found that this language exudes deference to the president in every clause. So he found it to be a very broad statute um, and to give the president broad deference to create policies like the Muslim ban. Second, Chief Justice Roberts found that that non-discrimination clause I was talking about earlier was not in conflict with the statute as a whole or with the proclamation specifically. And this is one thing that my co-counsel and I argued in an amicus brief to the US Supreme Court. We looked at the legislative history of the 1965 Act, and then we looked at this, both the statute as a harmonious whole, as well as specific sections to argue that this proclamation, in fact, threw a sledgehammer at the immigration statute and tried to rewrite what Congress had framed. We were unsuccessful. And Chief Justice Roberts found there to be a distinction between non-discrimination in the issuance of immigrant visas and entry. Even though in practical terms, this is a distinction with no difference. What in fact this ban does is deny visas and entry for people from particular countries. So the uh, Chief Justice also found that the ban was constitutional and he found that there was a legitimate purpose and that legitimate purpose was national security related. Um, I'm happy to talk about some of the dissents um, if that becomes of interest during the Q&A, but maybe I'll end a little with the human impact um, of this ban, which has since been expanded. It was expanded at the end of January to include uh, nationals from six new countries, um, including most immigrants from Burma, Eritrea, Kyrgyzstan, and Nigeria. So we now have a Muslim and African uh, ban, in a sense, and the, the human impact has been profound. Because most immigrants are affected, an immigrant is a term of art. 
It refers to someone who is seeking admission to the United States permanently. So what it means to exclude most immigrants from these countries is that if you are a Yemeni spouse of a U.S. citizen, that is a clearly legally qualifying relationship under our immigration statute. In fact, it is the most treasured because that is an immediate relative category in the immigration statute. Doesn't matter. Um, under the ban, you, you cannot be together um, because of the um, suspension clause. Similarly, if you are a Syrian who has been courted by a university for years for a PhD program, um, you're unable to come to the United States and pursue that educational program because of the ban. And finally, and I chronicle a lot of different stories in the book band, um, if you're wanting to travel to the United States for a milestone, um, one story I include is an, an Iranian couple and the, they're both physicians, so they're frontline workers too. And uh, the, the mom, the wife was a, giving birth to twins. And her parents wanted to travel to the United States to see the birth of their grandchildren and also to help out since they were both doctors, but they couldn't be here. And so there are so many stories like this about people who are affected by the ban. So let me close by saying that I don't think the courts are going to save us when it comes to immigration and national security. Um, they've played a pivotal role in uh, putting a stop to overreach by this government. But when it comes to the mix of immigration and national security, the challenge is, is too much for the court in many instances. And this is where we need to look to a legislative solution. And so there is a bill on the table called the No Ban Act, and it seeks to terminate the bans, set limits on that suspension clause I mentioned, and add religion as one factor that may not be discriminated against when it comes to the issuance of immigrant visas. So the travel ban or Muslim ban is a great story of the three branches of government. The executive branch is issuing a policy, uh, litigants are challenging it in court, it's upheld, and so the solution lies with the legislative branch to set limits on what the court found to be lawful. Let me stop there um, and look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Professor Wadhiya. I really appreciate it, um, and I appreciate that you really humanized the, the travel ban, the Muslim ban, because um, personally, um, I can say that my own family is directly impacted. I'm American. I was born here in Norfolk, Virginia, and my father, um, uh, you know, is married to an Iranian woman, and he's she's not allowed to come here. You know, they applied for a visa, and they weren't able to get a waiver, uh, even though he's a U.S. citizen and was naturalized. So it's, it's important to remember that, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not more, um, families are stranded and stuck overseas. Um, we actually have to go overseas to visit him and to visit her, um, you know, my stepmother. So it's it's actually a really it's a really devastating situation. But that is that is the way that it is after 9/11 um, with the current state of affairs. So we actually have um, one uh, a really important question that was just raised by one of our audience members. Thank you. Um, anonymous attendee. Thank you. <laughs> I'm curious if you all could talk about the use of religious spaces to provide sanctuary for folks the government is seeking to detain or deport. So the question is, do religious spaces have unique immunity from immigration prosecution? So um, as somebody who's also who's also a frontline public interest defense attorney, not prosecutor, um, uh, defending people who were asylees and others. Um, I know that, uh, you know, the, the question of sensitive sites and, um, you know, special spaces like churches or hospitals, et cetera, um, is an important one. And I remember I did a lot of work in New York on that. And I would, um, I would it's a very good question. Um, the, I, I, I would love to hear, uh, Professor Wadhia, your, your view on this. I don't believe that there is any specifics, like legal, statutory, or constitutional protection in place, but there might be some kind of like wink 
wink uh, agreement between ICE and communities. Um, but I'd love your, your view on that. Sure. So for sanctuary, really, it's, it's not a legal term, right? So you're not going to find the word sanctuary anywhere in the statute or in the regulations. Um, and it's been used over the years, you know, both for good, right, when it comes to the, the uh, origin of the question, um, but also to um, rival up the anti-immigrant base. Um, so, you know, the role that sanctuary should play in a legal discussion is, is a worthy question. Um, there is no specific statutory protection for somebody who might be undocumented and being uh, protected in a church. But as you alluded to, Aman, there is a policy that the Department of Homeland Security has that's long-standing called the Sensitive Locations Memo. And it states that immigration enforcement generally will not take place at or near hospitals, schools, or places of worship, except in extraordinary circumstances. And recently ICE reissued and re-upped that memo in the wake of COVID-19 because there are patients who might be afraid to get tested, and so they may not want to go to a clinic to get tested out of fear of their immigration stat status. Um, but the wink wink that you mm -hmm. alluded to actually has a term. It's called prosecutorial discretion, right? The government has money to deport about 400,000 or less than 4% of the 10 or 11 million people living in the United States without papers. So choices have to be made. Who are you going to target for enforcement and who are you going to leave alone? And historically, the government has exercised prosecutorial discretion to do a wink-wink to people who are being protected in places like churches. Right. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question. Just a little bit to that. Yeah, the, go ahead. You know, there are also attempts, uh, which I don't think will go anywhere, but there are attempts to make uh, religious liberty arguments under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act usually or sometimes directly under free exercise. Um, and you know there hadn't been much actual litigation because of the sensitive location policy mm -hmm. um i assume you know if a church were harboring any significant number of undocumented immigrants the court would find a compelling interest and say you can't take over immigration policy from us but we don't know that um there you know there have been some there was some litigation in alabama a few years ago with a very tough uh uh, any immigrant statute that seemed to preclude churches from delivering aid. Oh, okay. There's a RIFR decision in Arizona earlier this year. Uh, the Trump people prosecuted uh, some church folks who were leaving water and food in the desert where immigrants were often dying. Um, and the judge, trial judge dismissed on uh, RIFR grounds. I assume the Trump people were appealing. I don't know that yet. Uh, <coughs> so, excuse me. So there is some protection around the margins, but I'd be astonished if there's a right to provide sanctuary under. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question. Um, when we talk about national security, are there any policies or agencies that we can point to as exemplars of balancing basic rights, civil liberties in this context, and legitimate national security interests and concerns. So are there any, any policies or agencies that we can point to as a, exemplars of balancing basic rights and legitimate national security concerns? That's a good question. It's, um, it's anyone, any takers? Sure, but you know more about that than I would. I think all I can say is some administrations are better than others, and, and the current administration is not balancing much of anything. Correct. Yeah, I so I don't, I hesitate to use the word exemplar for, right. for any example, um, but I think that there are boots on the ground that are calculate you know that have historically calculated that balance so um the department of state very political um but there are consulates all over the world and embassies and they 
might interview someone who is applying for a visa and admission to the United States. So one function that uh, the State Department plays is to decide if a person is admissible and to go through the process of whether the person is inadmissible for reasons like for national security, you know, that to me illustrates a balance um, and a, a better illustration of who should be making decisions and the value of case-by-case -case decision making as opposed to some of the sort of categorical um, policies we saw <laughs> see coming out of the Trump administration. Sure. Um, I want to jump in and just provide one. I, I would love one um, answer to a specific question I've been grappling with. I worked a lot on the um, Muslim surveillance program in New York City. Um, there was a, a huge sprawling surveillance program at the local level by the NYPD, as you both probably know, and as many people who've attend, who are attending this um, webinar know. And I was always just alarmed at the fact that the NYPD would send in um, undercover police officers into mosques, right? Special sacred spaces. And the, the threshold legal require, threshold legal burden for that was unclear to me. And I think um, when we're talking about uh, a mosque, it's not, it is a public space, but it's not completely public. And when you have, um, the NYPD coming into a sacred space and you know, asking a specific person to collect data on uh, an imam or a set of people and then reporting that back to the government, um, there's, there's a real sort of balancing test that has to happen there when we're dealing with national security and with um, and religious freedom. And so I'd love um, you know, Professor Laycock to hear your view on what, is there, is there some kind of protection, is, is there any um, legal protection or any kind of privacy interest that a person might have when they enter um, a mosque, a Hindu, a Hindu temple, um, a church, um, and does the government have to have, maybe not probable cause, but some kind of articulable suspicion before they infiltrate that space? Um, you know, there's a long history of this kind of activity. The, the New York police uh, going into mosque is the most recent. There were cases back in the Reagan years, the immigration people were going into uh, churches in Arizona with large immigrant uh, congregations uh, and really destroyed some of those churches. All the immigrants quit coming because they were afraid. Um, there was litigation in Chicago in the 60s and 70s. The police were spying on political organizations, left-wing groups. Um, and the problem is no one's been able to come up with a good legal theory, right? It's intimidating, it's scary, cause people to stop going to church, but the government hadn't done anything to you, right? And 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 mosques and churches are open, right? They want converts. They want people to come join the church. So it's, you know, people, people have tried Fourth Amendment theories, um, but no one's really seized, and is it really a search if it's in a more or less public place? And the doctrine is, no, it's not a search. Um, They've tried uh, religious liberty theories. Is it a substantial burden on your religion? Well, they haven't really done anything to you yet. Um, I mean, a, a court that wanted to help could find it to be uh, burdensome, right? Could find it to be a search. Uh, but I'm not aware of any decisions that have done that yet. And I'm not a Fourth Amendment scholar, but this is also a question about discretion, right? And police discretion and right. where it's going to um, be present or not present. So the analog in immigration today might be whether ICE should be in courthouses, right? Courthouses are not covered by the sensitive locations memo. So if you're undocumented and you have a PFA hearing at a family court, um, you know, there'd be a real concern if ICE can show up at the court. Um, so so I, I would say that, you know, all, to always, because they'd be thinking about discretion, um, because it's also less costly. <laughs> and and there and there've been some seizures of immigrants, of course, in the Trump yes. years. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much. And I think um, we are out of time. And I just want to thank you both so so much um, for taking time to discuss this really important topic. And we're definitely going to be on the lookout for the um, 
FNU Tanzan versus Tanvir case, which is coming up on RIFRA and damages in particular. And uh, we're definitely going to keep uh, tabs on what's happening with immigration enforcement and the tension between national security, immigration, and uh, religious freedom. Thank you all very much. And please don't forget to sign up for your CLE credit. Thank you. Applause for our amazing panelists. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.